Good evening and welcome to our program. This is a program on affordable solar photovoltaics. It is brought to you by the Acorn Renewable Energy Co-op. And we also have sponsorship from the Addison County Regional Planning Commission and the Addison County Green Fund, as well as the company represented this evening, Renew Energy Systems. And this evening we have the founder of Renew with us, Brett Topel, and he's going to talk about uh, all of the wonderful things he knows about solar PV and how he can make it affordable. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask, and um, we hope to see you at all of our programs. And begin, Brett. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so I, I'm going to try and uh, just go through. Uh, maybe this will be too basic for some of you. Maybe it won't be enough detail. Um, I'm going to try and just cover um, the basics of solar electricity as you might think of them as a consumer. Um, you know, if you're thinking about essentially creating your own power at your own house, um, what, are the, what are the options, what are the, what are the things that affect the financing of doing it? Um, what, what, um, what does it mean to you as a, as a consumer of electricity to be making your own? So, um, I don't know that affordable solar, this is really going to be a solar, solar photovoltaics primer is the, what I you know, might also call this. Uh, um, whether it's affordable or not is probably based on whether you can afford it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so I, wanted, I was just going to touch briefly, and I, I have a slide that's very basic, but I'll try and, I'll try and be a little bit more uh, technical on how, P, how photovoltaics actually works, uh, which is uh, often abbreviated PV. So you'll, you, you'll see it probably both ways in these slides. It's either PV or photovoltaics. Just photovoltaics is a mouthful. So everyone in the industry says PV and dumbfounds people who have never heard of it before because they are hit with their first acronym right in the first sentence. So um, I just want to cover a couple terms and facts, uh, mostly to do with the energy and how, how it's denoted on your power bill and, uh, and how, it, how, how we talk about it when we're talking about what a um, what a solar system solar electric system does, uh, we're often talking talking about it in certain units of measure, and so I just want to cover them briefly. Um, I'm going to go through what the major options are for solar. Uh, just focusing on solar electric here. Um, my company does does solar hot water too, and there's a final slide at the end of here. We'll show a system that's uh, a house that has both solar electric and solar hot water in Rutland, but um, primarily. Um, we're, this talk is going to be on solar electric, um, and I, I'm going to in the in the fourth section there of solar versus other renewable energy technologies or RE, which I, I won't use that acronym at all, but <laughs> but it was just just so it could fit on the slide here. But um, solar hot water is obviously something else you could do as opposed to solar electric, or you could do both. Um, and there's there's a couple other technologies over here on the west side of the greens. Wind can make a lot of sense in some locations. Um, it, it might have might give you more trouble actually getting it installed, getting your neighbors to go for it. All that kind of stuff is tougher with wind. Um, and um, I'm just going to couple just a couple points on why now why, why you might want to decide to do this now. Um, the primary one being that other other people are doing it, and uh, and that eats eats into some of the incentives that are available to do it now. Um, I'm going to go through just some. A sample of the math of, of financing solar, uh, just so you get a handle on a uh, full-size system that would cover an average home. Um, it's it's very, very variable. But I'll I'll try and I'll try and point out what the variability is in that in that calc in those calculations, so you can kind of adjust. You, if you take notes or, or if you're thinking about this later, if you if you uh, think about it, you can adjust what we're talking about in terms of the math as it changes over time. Um, if you understand what what the what the parts of it are that change. Uh, I'm going to talk about net metering a little bit, which is essentially if you're on grid, uh, it's how you pay for your how you pay off the system. Um, it's a it's a law that's been a law in, in Vermont and uh, most most states in the union for a long time. Um, I think uh, someone one, one of the very first systems in Vermont was Noel uh, Noel Perrin's system. He was a, a Dartmouth uh, professor, and he put in a system, and he actually had to. Negotiate a contract with with CVPS. Like uh, he had to have a lawyer. They had a lawyer. They sat down and they negotiated a contract of how he was going to sell back his electricity to CVPS. Uh, and since then, it's become uh, written into law and become much easier to do. It's it's essentially a rubber for smaller systems. It's essentially just a rubber stamp 
um, from the Public Service Board to allow you to net meter and, uh, and becomes quite easy. And, it, and it's the, the, the method that you, you pay off your system if you're on grid. If you're off grid, you pay off your system by not having to have power. And uh, there's, there's other ways you figure out how your, how your payback would work. Uh, maybe you're very far from the power lines um, and your payback's instantaneous. So um, uh, on, um, I'm going to touch on monitoring systems and microinverters just because they're new and, and interesting. Um, microinverters provide a lot of flexibility in our design of systems uh, for on-grid, again. Um, and uh, monitoring systems, uh, are, I think, are kind of the wave of the future. Um, almost all microinverters are sold with monitoring built in. Um, and, um, and other systems uh, from small to really big um, are monitored now. And uh, it, it's become very affordable to monitor them and a, and a great idea because you have a real idea of you know, what your production is from day to day. Um, so, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just run through this quickly, how, how you get started if you're thinking about running out and buying solar. So. All right, so just briefly, this is a pretty basic slide here, but um, it, it, it does encapsulate why solar is so great. All it has to do, a photovoltaic cell has to do is sit in the direct sunlight and um, the, um, the, by the nature of the photovoltaic, photovoltaic material, uh, electrons will start to be ejected from the, from the material. And those electrons will flow around in, in a circuit, because they'll, they'll flow out and they'll flow right back in. Uh, in the meantime, they'll do work. Um, and that work is, we, we refer to that as electric power. Um, the, um, the main way that most of, the, most of these um, electrons will be harnessed is with an inverter. And an inverter, also called a converter in Europe, but an inverter essentially converts from DC to AC. And, um, and that process is fairly efficient. Most modern inverters are in the 96 to 97 percent efficiency range, which means they're only putting out a little bit of heat. They're not losing too much of the power to heat. And they're putting most of it into either a battery system for off-grid, or they're putting it directly onto the power lines. And if they're putting on the power lines, they have to meet a certain um, UL code. Uh, it's called UL1741. And when you tell the power company like CVPS or Green Mountain Power that you want to uh, connect to their system, they'll say, fine, does your inverter meet this UL listing? And if it does, then you're all set. Um, I put the batteries in there. Batteries are less common than you would think. A lot of people, when they think about solar, think about batteries um, because so much of the history of solar has been off-grid, and it's been powering homes that otherwise couldn't be powered uh, reasonably. Actually, I, I would say it couldn't be powered reasonably at all, because a generator is, if you've ever lived with a generator, it's a pretty uh, inconsistent and noisy and smelly a way to get your power. So, so solar has been associated with making it possible to live in certain areas, um, and, and those systems are all based on batteries. Um, most of the, most current systems, if they are on grid, don't even have a battery in the system. But if there's a desire to essentially to not have um, you know not have power outages, or you're at the end of you know CVPS's line and you have a lot of power, you have a lot more power outages than somebody living in town. You might have a desire to have a battery in the system, um, and it changes the your your choices for inverter, um, and it does complicate the system a little bit, increases costs a little bit but it gives you a, a very reliable power source. Essentially, uh, depending on the size of the battery bank, you are essentially turning your home into an un uninterruptible power supply, like you might have next to your computer, uh, except you're doing it for your whole home or, or certain circuits in your home that you really care about. So it can be very nice. Um, and then the home uses electricity. And the one thing that, should, that sh this slide should actually show is home uses electricity or the grid gets the electricity. It really doesn't matter, and that's what net metering is all about. Um, in, in terms of where the, uh, where the power goes. And where the actual figuring out where your power goes, um, that's where monitoring comes in to actually figure out where the power has gone from a particular day, whether it fed the grid or whether it fed your home. Um, and monitoring can answer some of those questions on a minute-by-minute you know, -minute basis. I should say, if you have questions that you want to ask me as I go, feel free to ask them, and I'll, uh, if they're if, I, if I'm not going to cover them later, I'll stop and talk about them. So. Um, I just want to cover, these are the terms I was talking about. Um, they're useful, especially if you're looking at your understanding your power bill. 
So not, not even if you're necessarily uh, thinking about doing solar, just understanding your power bill. These are, these are a couple terms to, to come and to be familiar with. And um, it, a, nice, a nice fact is actually that last fact on the screen right there is that a one kilowatt system, if you were to install, uh, well, let me cover the terms because they go in order. So a kilowatt is a standard unit of electric output. Um, it's a way to measure the size of the system. Um, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have a relationship necessarily to your usage at all, um, but it does have a, a, direct, a direct correspondence to the production of the system. So um, if I tell you that I'm going to give you a 1,000 watt system or a 1 kilowatt system, in Vermont that will sit in the sun on average for a certain amount of time and produce a certain amount of power. And it works out nicely that that will produce in Vermont roughly one kilowatt system produces roughly a thousand kilowatt hours per year. It's actually a little bit higher, but um, but that's that's a good it's a good ball, it's a good thumbnail to thumb, rule of thumb to keep in mind. Um, and a kilowatt hour is actually um, a measure of electric production, and that is directly related to your power bill. So it's it's the amount of it's the amount if you have one kilowatt. It, let's say you had a perfect one kilowatt and there were no system losses or anything else. You had one kilowatt of DC installed, say, on your roof. Um, it's set in the sun for one hour. It would produce one kilowatt hour. And that is something that you would often see on your bill. Um, a typical New England home uses 600 kilowatt hours per month as a, as a rule of thumb. So if there's 30, 30, days in that, 30 days in that month, you're using roughly 20 kilowatt hours a day just to kind of put these things in, in perspective. A conserving home could easily cut that in half without any, with, I, I would say actually without missing a beat, really. It's just a question of your appliance choices um, and a lot of other things. You know, also what you choose to do with electricity. If you choose to do some tasks that could be done maybe with propane or, or other fuel sources, um, do them with electricity, you might have a much higher bill uh, or you might use a lot more kilowatt hours per month. So it, what was the number you gave that was typical? 600 is what ISO New England uses. So. 600 kilowatt hours per Yeah, but remember that's New England and Connecticut has a lot of central air installed. That's so. Per month. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Connecticut, places like Connecticut and Massachusetts, they're included in that figure and they have a lot of central air conditioned homes included in that number. But yeah, on average 600 kilowatt hours for New England. I, I think typical Vermont is probably closer to 500. And, and anyone that's given any thought to conservation is probably closer to 450. So, and including just doing things like CFL light bulbs, that's an immediate, an immediate cut. Um, again, getting efficient appliances, particularly your refrigerator and your freezer. Those are going to be your top two. So. All right, I'll try not to bore you too much. Just two more of these things. So I, I just covered that a little bit. Um, you, what we because of that correspondence between kilowatts installed in a solar system and kilowatt hours, um, it, it actually works out fairly neatly that three, three kilowatts, I would actually say that, that on the high end, so you would actually, you would say three to six kilowatts installed can come very close to net metering the average home to, to zero, meaning you can reduce your electric bill, you can reduce your, I'm going to talk more about what net metering means later, but you could reduce your electric bill to zero with a system in that size range. And where the variation comes in is, uh, will be directly related to your bills. And so if you've lived in a place for a long time and you have a lot of bills, um, if somebody comes to talk to you about solar, they should want to look at your bills because they can tell you what size system would be 100% of your usage. And there's some reasons why you really wouldn't want to install much more than 100% unless you are feeling generous to your neighbors. So your, your, main, your main goal in, in setting up a system that's going to be the most financially beneficial to you is going to be to be at 100% or slightly under. So you want to look at your bills and figure out what 100% what really is. Um, you could also, the, the nice thing about uh, on-grid systems is they could be whatever size you can afford. So within, actually almost without, without limit with microinverters nowadays. So they could be whatever size system you can afford would be, uh, would be possible to, to design. So, um, and there's, a, uh, there's just a uh, rough total system cost. And when I do the math uh, on solar, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. So um, things to look at and, and, and 
there, the options that there are in, in solar are, um, and there's actually going to be a picture of photovoltaics here on the next slide, so we'll start, we'll start seeing some actual pictures here, but I just wanted to run down these. Um, the things you'd be looking at as a consumer, there, there's lots of other things to consider about photovoltaics, but as a consumer, uh, you, you want to think about what you want the system to do, and I, I, got in, I mentioned that a little bit with the battery backup. Like, do you want to just offset your bill, or do you want to make sure you never see the lights go out? You know, those are, that's uh, some basic design criterion that you'd be giving to somebody who is designing a, a solar system for you. If you're off-grid, you would be giving them a lot more design criteria, with, like what are all your loads that you want to run, how long do you want to run them for if it's gray out, you know, if it's gray out for a week, do you want to have a generator in the system? Do you not want to have a generator in the system? The, 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 the concerns and, and, and questions for somebody who's off-grid are, are quite a bit longer than the, than the ones for, the, for somebody who's on-grid. For on-grid, there's really uh, how, much, how much system do I, can I afford? And um, you know, do I want batteries in the system? Those are really the two, two main considerations for on-grid. Um, but the other considerations that apply, whether it's on-grid or off-grid, uh, battery backed or not, are where it's going to go. And a lot of people will look at, at their, their house, and it's a great place to start. Do I have a south facing face of the roof line? Because that's going to be, I would say, by and large, 100% accuracy, that's always the cheapest place to put solar. You, one thing you have an established structure, so you don't have to build a new structure. Uh, you don't have any permitting issues. Because in Vermont, if, it, if it's on the roof, it's only a one-stop shop for getting it approved. It's just a state permit, essentially. Um, and you, you just, you, it, the roof is, is always going to be the cheapest place for residents to put it. But if you, have a, a, uh, if you have a house and the ridge line of the house runs perfectly north-south, you have two faces that face east-west, um, it may not be the best. It, it depends. I would have said, actually, before microinverters, that you really should just consider the ground. But actually putting separate systems that are, all, that are both microinverter based on the east and west face probably still comes out ahead, depending on how much the mounting structures are going to cost to install. Um, you're, you're losing probably on order of about 11%. And I'll, I'll show you a tool you can use to figure out how much you would lose versus a perfectly south-facing um, array. But you're probably ahead. At the end of 20, most of the warranties on solar, the panels themselves are 25 years. You're probably ahead with that, sl that, light, that loss in production. You're probably still ahead by not having the upfront cost of the additional structure to, to ground mount it. Um, pole mount, I don't know if anyone, has anyone seen the array in front of CVPS? Uh, that's a pole mount array. And I have a picture in a sec. Um, the, uh, well, there's plenty of examples of roof mount array. A ground mount array is probably the, the one confusing difference between ground mount and pole mount. Ground mount arrays are um, typically done on rails. Um, they're quite a bit cheaper than pole mount arrays because they use less concrete and steel. Um, but they have to, you have to pick your sites pretty carefully because some sites are uh, not really, you, you'll do so much groundwork to get a flat area to put a, put a ground mount array in that it won't be economical anymore. Um, and then one choice, again, across all these, all these options is whether to put monitoring on the system. And some inverters come with monitoring basically built in, and uh, others need it added on. All right, here's a on-grid roof-mounted example. Um, it's probably the most basic and, and the, I think the, probably the most prevalent in Vermont, though the ones you may notice the most are on the ground. These, these tend to, it, depending on the roof color, and the panel color, which is now usually available in black and with a black frame, they can really kind of disappear on the roof and people don't even notice them. But um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of ease of installation, cost of installation, and everything else, uh, an on-grid roof-mounted uh, photovoltaic system is as, about as cheap and as easy as it gets. Next up from there is you can see that actually in this house's case, <laughs> One of the, the, the optimal roof was already taken by solar. <laughs> they wanted more solar. Uh, and the, the, next, the, the, how, the piece of the house that's right behind the poles there is, has a bad orientation. So they chose to put poles uh, in front of the house. And um, you know, aesthetically, uh, you, have to go get a, you have to go show why aesthetically that's OK in your state permit application, <laughs> uh, why your neighbors won't mind seeing that. 
and why you know why it's you know why it's not going to impact anything. But in general, it's not that hard to get a pole mount um, permitted, and um, you know. I don't necessarily always think that the back of the array, which is what they'll mostly be looking at, is is the most attractive. I actually I like the way the front of arrays look. <laughs> front of arrays look. I think that that looks pretty neat, but the back of an array um, is not the most attractive thing. I probably should have shown you the back of that array, but um, it's white and there's wiring and so. Um, but if you're looking for a location, the pull mount is has a couple advantages. One, you can seasonally adjust that pull mount um, for probably about a 5% increase in power. So if you're willing to do that small amount of effort two or three times a year, you can move it. Um, and you can really go anywhere. I, I, there are very few properties that a pole mount can't produce power. Of course, if the trees come right into your, come right in, then you might have a property that doesn't work for you. And I'll, I'll mention an option later in terms of uh, group net metering, that if you're really enthusiastic about solar, but you really don't have a spot, it's, uh, it could be a great option. Here's a much prettier view of pole mounts. <laughs> They're looking beautiful up there. And no, in this case, no one will ever see the back because they're backed right up to a, the forest. And, um, and they, they look great, I think. I think they look fine. We actually, we actually uh, mocked that up before we, uh, before we did that. Um, so it, it's definitely an option. You can, you can ask whoever's going to install the system to, to draw. It's quite easy to draw now, you know, to draw three-dimensional pictures and, and slide them into photos to let let you know what it'll look like before it actually gets built, and um, yeah. So uh, I think just one. This is a, just a, really this is an off-grid house, and I just wanted to show it. But both these systems, the old system which has the smaller panels, and the new system on the on the uh, your left there, um, those are awning mount. So just one more option. We've done this for a school, um, actually for our own offices. We're doing an awning mount. And, uh, and for this house, we've, we've done so we've, we've over the past five years or so, we've done a handful of awning mounts. They're more complicated, but they allow the solar to fit into some locations where it might have trouble otherwise. So, all right. Um, so why solar? And I, uh, we get asked this question a lot. People are thinking about they want to do something with their house or they want to do something with their property commercially. Why, why solar? And I think it's a good question to ask. Um, and the most honest answer is to say you should do all your energy efficiency first. <laughs> um, because energy efficiency, sealing the, sealing the structure, like weatherproofing and doing better insulation, is so cheap you can't compete with it. I mean, it's, you, you should pay off any of that stuff in the next year, at most two years, um, after, you, after you did it. Um, you, you know, and, and in an ideal world, Everyone would do that stuff first, and then they would think about renewable energy options. Um, on the other hand, renewable energy, like solar, is easier. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of displacement that goes on with your living environment when you do those easy things. Well, they're cheap, they're cheap but there's a lot of displacement that can go on. Um, it can be difficult to even do it in some homes. So um, Vermont has never required anyone to have an energy audit before they did solar. However, in Massachusetts, it's a law. You, you know, before you can get participate in the state rebate program, you have to have an energy audit done, and you, I believe, you even have to have a plan on how you're going to meet that energy audit's recommendations. Um, and they're just trying to, they're they're trying to point people in that direction that they should look at the efficiency of their home heat. You know, especially mostly space heating, which is the major energy load in the home usually, that they should look at space heating first and then look at other things they could do. Yep. Doesn't it also make sense to um, implement all of those recommendations from the audit first so you'll know what the size of your solar system should be? To some extent. Um, most, mostly um, solar, solar electricity, for instance, isn't really tied to very closely to your, to your space heating load at all. And most of the energy efficiency recommendations would be improving your space heating efficiency. <laughs> So solar electric is kind of disconnected from that. Solar hot water, especially if there's a space heating component to the solar hot water, might be directly tied to that. And so you, you would want to know, well, OK, so we're, we're going through this much oil now, but we are expecting to go through 30% less oil once we make all these changes to our house. And so we can plan a smaller solar hot water system accordingly. So. Um, I'm not going to try and go too much into solar hot water. I think it's too much to talk about. 
for this talk, but um, there are, are a lot of things that can be done with solar hot water that can aim it towards your space heating load, but none of them are, they, once you start aiming, w once you get away from your domestic hot water goal of covering that, they get a lot more expensive and probably get actually less efficient than solar electricity in terms of what could you do with the same amount of money. So, um, so that, yeah, so then probably the number one thing is it's, it's a great way to make electricity if it were, obviously, it's all dependent on cost, right? But it's a great way to make electricity. Um, you have a PV module that can comfortably, you know, essentially, it can comfortably be warrantied for 25 years. There are PV modules in space that have been working as long as I've been alive, so 43 years. Um, they're, they are still working and still producing. What happens to PV modules over time is they solarize, which means they actually the sun itself degrades the modules a little bit. But it's on the order of generally half a percent power loss per year. So that's a long time before you're even looking at, at a 30% power loss. Um, and, um, you know, mo most people take a, a more conservative number. They take 0.75% and they say, well, we hope that at 25 years you're at, you know, generally it'll be at 80% power in 25 years. Which means the thing you purchased in year one is still going to produce 80% of its power in year 25. So it's a pretty phenomenal machine. If you think of it, it's this machine with no moving parts that can generate electricity. I mean, <laughs> it has intrinsic value. It's, it's a, a, the, a PV module is, is a fairly amazing investment when you think about it. It's, 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 a, it's a, a, a parts free generator. So it doesn't produce any pollution while producing energy. Obviously, there's some pollution created when it's, when it's created, when the module's created. But it's generally fairly limited. Um, most most surveys I've seen are that in the first, sometimes in the first two, depending on the, how the module's made, but at least within the first five years, it's, it's paid off its pollution and carbon debt and will spend the rest of its time producing clean electricity free of that debt, if you want to think of it that way. It's kind of an equation of, um, <coughs> you know, you had to do something to make this product and what'd you do, you know, at least this, unlike most products that just get consumed, this product will sit there and kind of essentially offset some other way of producing power, and that's how you kind of do that calculation. Another main advantage of, of solar electricity versus other types of renewable energies you might do, or even versus uh, energy efficiency improvements sometimes, is just its, its ease, ease of use and the speed with which you can get it installed. You can call somebody up, and you can say, I want solar. Uh, they can come and do a site visit. Uh, if their schedules are free, they could be back and done with the project in, in really inside of a couple weeks. Um, it's, it's routing some wires around your house, um, making a connection in your breaker panel, uh, and putting things on the roof. Um, and it's fairly, it could, or, or on a pole, or on a ground mount. But it, it's fairly straightforward. Um, whereas solar hot water requires plumbing and generally is a little bit longer to install, though not a lot. Um, and wind it also can be set up quickly, but Solar generally, in terms of permitting and everything else, tends to be the fastest. I guess one, one measure that we have of that is, is Vermont passed one the, well, the first state to pass a feed-in tariff, which is a, a mechanism for paying for solar. And um, that the feed-in tariff actually supplies a, rate, a high rate of return for all, all the types of renewable energy technologies. Um, and these are fairly big systems that are getting built. We, we built one of the, the smaller ones, the 30, a 30 kilowatt array on a bus terminal in White River, but there's been a 2.2 megawatt array commissioned up in South Burlington. Uh, there's, a, there's two megawatt arrays that are either ready to be broken ground or commissioned all over the state. And of the other technologies that are essentially competing with that, um, they were given their own allocation of that feed-in tariff. Uh, all the other technologies are not built yet. So solar is fast, in terms of either big, that's in terms of much bigger systems, but even in terms of your home, solar tends to get thought about and then done in, in relatively short time frames. So. Um, there is a wide variety, there's a lot of installers like Renew Energy Systems, uh, which makes it easy to get it done. And the, there is generally a, a good availability of products. Um, there are occasional shortages, but <laughs> Uh, over the past five years, we've dealt with two, uh, 
two module shortages uh, that lasted the better part of an install season. But <laughs> in general, there are, um, there's good availability of products. And certainly right now, there's great availability of product. The economy has turned down a little bit, but worldwide, there's this huge demand for solar. So there's over 200 manufacturers of PV modules in the world. And even of the first tier, there's still probably 20. Uh, in the second tier, there's about almost 80. And then there's all the rest. They all make modules. And the nice thing about it is they all make modules generally to the same standard. If they're going to sell them in the, in the US, they make them to a UL standard that is fairly homogenous. So they are roughly a commodity. Um, they're all roughly made the same way. They tend to be made out of a sheet of tempered glass um, surrounded by an aluminum frame. Uh, with, the, with the photovoltaic material inside with some kind of electrical contacts contacting that, and then a backing that's usually, actually, there's only about two companies that make the backing. One of them's Dow. Uh, they make a, a, a backing for it. And that makes them weatherproof and highly known, I guess, would be the best way to characterize them. A, a photovoltaic modules are a very well-known product at this point. They've been around for a long time, and people know how they behave. Is there a lot of innovation now? Are they coming up with better products that are more efficient? There's, there's definitely a lot of in innovation still. Um, I would say the, the bulk of the innovation is how to manufacture them cheaper. And that's been the, over my involvement in solar. I, I came from computer en engineering five years ago, and got into solar. Um, over that five years, the, the main improvements have been manufacturing, um, the manufacturing efficiency of modules. Um, and that's, uh, that's driven down the cost of everything to do with them because the other parts of the system, the inverter and the racking, have all followed that down because they've had to it had to follow it because the main component of cost is the photovoltaic module, and that's that's gone down. As has our install cost. So to start, our labor has gotten more efficient too. So the whole package of everything it takes to put solar into into use has gone down in cost, and and mostly due to due to innovation. Um, and I'm going to get this, hit this in the next slide of, of what I'm talking about here, but the predictability of the sun. This is solar's strongest, I think probably strongest card, is that the National Renewal, Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, has looked at what the sun does you know, over a long period. And so we, there's a calculator available to the public, and there's even, there's even fancier programs that can do this, but they're basically using all the weather data that they can and they're taking your latitude into account, and they can tell you with a great degree, great degree of accuracy what that, solar, what, what that solar system that you might install today will do for you over the next 25 years. That can't be said nearly as easily for wind um, or for a lot of other technologies, but for the sun, it's, it's quite reliable. So I just want to, so uh, hopefully, can people see that in the back? Is that too small? I don't know. I was trying to fit a whole web page in. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll point. Um, so the, the key thing, if you're jotting this down, the key thing is that um, you could Google PV Watts. It's all one word, PV Watts. And um, if you do, this is version one of PV Watts, which has been a, a workhorse for the solar industry for a long time. Uh, it's still the easiest for, any, for anyone to just come in and use. Um, so PV watts, what, I, what I've done here is taken the front page of PV watts and I've shown how, essentially, this is how you would predict or I would predict or anyone, anyone that wants to predict what, what a solar system will do would actually do it. Um, you, you come in and if you're willing to take all their defaults, this is how the screen would look. Uh, I just changed the system size to 5 kilowatts. So I've taken a typical, this should wipe out, a, wipe out the electric bill for uh, a typical, you know, I would say a typical Vermont home. This will produce about 500 kilowatt hours a month on average. Um, on, the next, on the next screen, you'll see what it'll actually do each month. But the, um, the D rate factor there takes into account all the inefficiencies in the system, the loss in the inverter, the loss in the wires, the loss due to dust on the panels. Everything that anyone ever throws at you and goes, what about this with solar? What about that with solar? It's all in that number. That derating factor is an engineer's way of saying it's all in there. And there's a, if you click on that little button to the right of the derate factor, you can see all the factors that are in there and how they get, how they get added to be 77%. So that 77% that is, 
is saying very conservatively, I put this much on the roof and I lose 33% of it on this way to the power line. It's a very conservative number. Um, I, I think actually with modern, modern panels, modern inverter, um, and you can go in, somebody can do this and they can put in your actual numbers from a system you're thinking of buying and come up with probably a higher number, probably easily closer to 82%, uh, 83%, which makes a big difference. Uh, you're, you're not losing that power. Um, the array type is fixed tilt that I did there. And this is a very easy way if you're looking at, I, I'm not going to talk about tracking at all, but if you want to know what tracking can do, you can change that to either single access tracking, which means it's going to track uh, during the day, or dual access tracking, which means it's going to track the sun both season to season and during the day. So if you want to see what dual access tracking will do, um, you can change that to dual access tracking and just leave everything else the same. It, the array tilt no longer matters, and the array azimuth. A azimuth means which way is it pointing. This is where you could come in and say, well, let's say I just did the east side of my home. You know, I've got this roof line that points completely east. And so you, instead of 180, you just make that uh, 90 and run the, run the same. You could run it, you run, it, run it the way it is now, which is the, the array pointing perfectly true south. Rerun the pro, just back, hit the back button on your browser, run it again at 90, and then just jot down the numbers and put one over the other. You can see what fraction you're losing by, by pointing east. Um, I put in probably a typical cost now. I think CVPS has raised their rates, so that's probably a, a pretty close guess, 15 cents a kilowatt hour for what you'd pay. Um, and then obviously I'm not, I'm not connected to PV Watts right now. I'm just going to hit the next button on my slideshow, but this is the next page. And if, it was, if that was too small, then this one's probably too small too. But what it comes out to for the whole year is about 5,835 kilowatt hours produced. Um, and you're getting that, that first column of the results is the month. Uh, so from January through December. The second column is the amount of solar radi radiation. That doesn't vary. That's just based on your latitude. Um, and the, the weather station is Burlington. Um, and then the um, energy produced is a function of how big your array is, and the energy value is a function of how, how much you set energy costs. And the, the, the 15 cents is a good number to use because that's your credit in net metering is going to be equal to your retail cost of power. So that's a reasonable number to use for the cost. So in other words, that ra array at that, rate of, at that rate in year one, say, you know, the cost of electricity hasn't gone up at all. Uh, everything else is equal. Um, to the defaults that they that PV Watts provide, you're going to produce about eight hundred and seventy-five dollars worth of power per year. Good. Can you explain how they credit the net metering? Is it annual? Uh, I'm going to get to that. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, we can. We often do in our in our presentations to people on solar. We make a spreadsheet of how fast they're going to pay this stuff off. Um, typically, I think at these current prices of electricity and everything else, we you know assume a small increase in, in power costs. Um, typically, power costs have gone up by about two and a half percent a year. Um, you can look at it and say roughly eleven year payback time. And that's that's essentially a lot of people. Their first approach on an on grid system is what's my payback, and so that's if you if all your other if all your other considerations of um, what's good about producing the power go away. That's maybe one of your main, main considerations. Um, right now, the um, rebates have, have consistently decreased in Vermont, which is reasonable because so of system costs. Um, they still re represent a fairly sizable percentage of your investment. So that would be probably the main reason to actually act now is that um, though one of those bills that uh, Gary had mentioned tries to stabilize the incentive rebate, probably long term it's going to continue to go down. So that's probably. Eventually the rebate isn't needed either too because these systems are already producing. Uh, I've done, I haven't done the calculation in a while, but last I did it with all the subsidies, these systems are producing seven cents a kilowatt hour power, which is half what CVPS is selling it to you for. So they're, they're already a good deal and that's with the federal tax credit and the Vermont subsidy included, but um, they, as, as the utility rates come up and costs go down, um, you reach a point which is called grid parity, 
And grid parity is different for every location. It's different for every power cost. But what it means is if you have the money to invest, you can buy yourself cheaper power just on the face of it without any subsidy or credit. Um, so I'm starting here with a typical cost for a five kilowatt system, like now, and it, and and this is uh, this is a, a variable based on you know let's say that's probably a, a very good cost putting on the roof. Um, it doesn't include maybe the cost of concrete and steel to put it on the ground. Um, it may not include putting it very far away from the house and having a long conduit and wiring run back to the house. So anyway, it, it that number. Um, would, would change, and that number is something you'd want to give, have somebody give you an estimate of how much a system was really going to cost. And also, if that seems like a really big number, well, you can decide to do a fifth of it. Um, you can decide to do a tenth of it. Um, you can, because of, of some of the changes, the main one being microinverters, you can really do any size system you want. You can have a two-module system, one-module system sitting up there, um, except for the kind of the overhead of putting that in. You know, somebody has to come and do that, and so you, you're not spreading that. You're not you're not spreading that over a bigger system. Um, essentially, the math is is all the same, if, even as you scale it down. Or, or um, up, it generally your cost per watt would go up, would go down as you go up into a commercial system. But um, this is this is looking at a typical residential system. Um, what's really interesting is if you go to Massachusetts, you can see what systems cost every every last every last single system that's been rebated in Massachusetts, you can see the invoice cost, which I think is fascinating. But um, you can go and you can look up every invoice cost of every, every residential system, actually re every residential and commercial system installed in Massachusetts. So um, I think that's, it's very interesting. What you can see though is that their higher rebate causes them to pay more. <laughs> because, <laughs> because there's less incentive to pass along the decrease in cost of PV when you've got such a great state subsidy. Um, so uh, your federal tax credit is completely a function of your final invoice cost. So if that's how if twenty seven thousand is how much it costs, then you're going to take thirty percent of that and take it as a federal tax credit. The law was passed till twenty sixteen. It was most recently, so um, that's the the federal law that covers that 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 federal tax credit's in place till twenty sixteen. Um, it I would imagine it might be extended with a reduced percent after that. Also, your ability to use up that credit lasts beyond 2016, I believe. It's fairly long-term. Like, if you can't use up $8,100 of federal tax credit in your first year, you can carry it over and carry it over and carry it over. I don't know how long. I'm not an accountant. Oh. Is that both for new and old construction? If you're building a new house, do they get the same rebate? Well, builders can actually take it. Like, if, if, if you have a spec home being built, builders well, can take it. If you were doing your own, if you are your own GC... If you're you your take own it. general contractor and you're, you know, yeah. building a home new, you still get the full credit. Yeah, you just want to separate out the costs that were actually solar. The easiest way to do that is somebody gives you an invoice, but, you know, um, and in this cost that are solar, you, there's just a schedule on your federal tax return, not the easy, not the easy, but on your more complicated federal tax return, there's a schedule for solar, and you just say how much it cost you, and <coughs> they, they believe you yeah. until they don't. You're fronting the $27,000 always, right? You are. It's a tax credit, totally. Yep. Yeah. So we see a lot of people that want to do this, want to do a lot of the work later in the year so that the tax credit is much closer to them. Um, that's quite common. Um, you know, our, our install rate and our install rate heads up in fall, actually, and tapers off after January 1st because people want to be closer to their ability to actually take the tax credit. Um, there are several banks, including um, People's, it used to be Chittenden, um, that have green loans. Um, and if you, you know, I, I think the math probably still works pretty well if you, if you have a, if you take a loan to do it. Um, you, you, especially if you just want to bridge like the amount of federal tax credit, I think it still makes sense. It still makes sense. Um, and the, um, the Vermont subsidy is, is based purely on the amount of wattage, the DC name, what's referred to as the DC nameplate wattage of the modules that you install. Uh, so it doesn't have anything to do with, they ask you about the inverter, but they don't really care. They just want to know that it's UL listed. Um, what they really care about is, is the amount of watts of PV that you actually put into the system, and that's what they pay based on. So that calculation is just 5, 5,000 watt system times 75 cents a watt. That number might go up, might, might stay the same, might decrease. It all depends on the, how the results of that bill come out and 
um, other funding sources that they have for it. Um, but your total, your, your out of pocket after you take the tax credit would be, would be the $15,000 number. And then to look at, we'll get into this a little bit more of how the, the mechanics of how this payoff happens, but your basic payout is at 15 cents a kilowatt hour of net metering credit versus the production that we calculated on PV watts before, it gives you about 875 a year. You figure if you want to do a very simple calculation, there, there's better ways to do that calculation, obviously, because net present value of money and all that. But a simple calculation of, of how much that's worth would be to just multiply that by 25 years. That doesn't include any increase in, in electric rates, and it's probably, a good, it's probably good to do a spreadsheet that's a little bit more sophisticated that starts to take in the, the value of money, but also takes into account the fact that utility rates are going to increase, at least with inflation, if not. Thank you. What am I missing? You represented at a, at a, earlier that uh, it would pay back in 10 years. Yep. I look at the 875 uh, return per year on a 15,000 dollar out of pocket and that's not 10 years it more like, yeah it's it's cl very close to 20 yeah um, it's, it's certainly in the high teens the, they well the 11 years may stick in my head because of because of the higher higher rebate values that were in place just a few months ago um, that would affect it so it, I, I'm just trying to lay out the I'm just trying to lay out the numbers they may not match up with yeah so. okay thank you good catch All right, I'm going to go over net metering because it's the it's the way that you would the, the way that you do pay back these systems. So when your when your PV system produces more than you need, the excess electricity goes directly to the grid. Um, that means essentially you're turning if you're using at that moment if you if the house is using less than you're producing, you actually are turning your meter backwards. Whether it's an old analog meter or whether it's digital, uh, you're turning your you're turning your meter backwards. Um, when you're um, when you're doing that, you're you're either building up a credit with the, with your bill, or um, you're you're just using less. So you're, at that moment, you're using less power. What typically happens is that in the summertime, you'll create a credit on your bill, and it can be quite substantial. And in the wintertime, you'll probably use more from the grid than you than you would, and so you'll start using up that credit. The way um, net metering is done in Vermont is you have a 12-month rolling credit, meaning Everything you produce excess in July of 2011, you'll have till July of 2012 to use up. It's a great way to do it because it lets you go through the winter and use your credit. Uh, there's a few states that are actually on a calendar year, and that's terrible for net metering. <laughs> it means all your, you had to use it all in December, or you're not going to have it. So you know, Vermont's got a good, good net metering role. Um, and, uh, and basically, the um, utility will maintain a credit balance like CVPS or, or GMP will maintain. You'll, you'll actually have a negative bill, and that's how you can find out. You know what your credit is. You, you maintain a negative bill until you no longer have a negative bill. And you, what you're really aiming for is to essentially have a zero bill, a zero dollar bill for the year. There's some fees that won't actually go away, but mostly a zero dollar bill. Um, and the, the thing to do is to use PV watts to try and figure out from your bills what close to zero would be. Because putting in a system that's bigger than that, you're not, the utility is not going to give you anything for that. You're just giving that electricity away to them uh, under net metering. So, um, In Massachusetts, actually, you get to sell it at the wholesale rate of about two cents a kilowatt hour, so, <laughs> which is better, because at least you don't have to give it away. But. <laughs> But um, yeah, it, net metering and um, another another interesting thing that I mentioned earlier is if you did want to, let's say you did want, you had space or whatever, you had you wanted to design a system that was much bigger than you could actually use. Uh, we've had a lot of municipalities be interested in that. They want to include the school system or uh, you just want to, you have a group of neighbors that want to do it or your co-op and you want to have a number of people uh, get together and build a bigger system, achieve some economy, achieve better economies of scale and better costs for building the system. What group net metering allows you to do is just say, I want to apply the output of this system to Bill for John Doe, Jane Doe, 
John Q. Public, doesn't matter where they live, they just have to be in the same utility and their bills will get the application of the net metering. Then you can work out some financial arrangement among yourselves of how you're going to divvy up the proceeds of the, you know, of the proceeds of the of the output. But that's the basics. You wanna... Yeah, Brett. Yep. Uh, I should say at this point that Acorn Energy Co-op is in the early stages of planning uh, to build at least one 150 kilowatt uh, array and with a group net metering which we would offer to our customers. A uh, typical customer would say uh, maybe four kilowatts. Uh, I would like to sign up for four kilowatts and uh, nothing happens at home. It's the, the meter is uh, not going to spin backwards or anything, but they, they will, uh, uh, they'll see it in their monthly bills. Yep. Uh, it's a, it, I, I think group net metering opens up a huge range of possibilities for how, how systems can get built and paid for. Yeah. Um, I think I'm only talking to one person here. This is uh, the one person who's in GMP territory. Um, however, if um, House Bill 150... What? 50, H56. H56 passes, yeah. then all the utilities have to do what GMP is doing? Well, it's, it's, about, it's about the same. It's a 20 cent. Right. Which works out to be roughly the six cents or five or six cents. Yeah, GM, GMP, if GMP customers pay roughly 14 cents a kilowatt hour, GMP is saying, well, if you put in solar, or actually, uh, I think other renewables are included in it, but if you put in solar and we'll, we'll, we'll put a separate meter, the entire production, whether you, you use it or not, they put the meters right after the, right after the inverter. Uh, they'll put a meter in and they will read that meter and give you a six cent per kilowatt hour payment uh, in addition to net metering, which makes the effective value of your, um, of your production uh, usually close to 20 cents a kilowatt hour. What it also does is if you do overproduce, you still get, you can actually get cash for that. So you actually get paid six cents a kilowatt hour. So um, if they make that the rule for other utilities, then it will be across the whole room here. What towns are served by Green Mountain Power? Well, uh, yeah, a large part of South uh, Burlington, not not Burlington itself, but a lot of it, most of the mostly around Burlington, um, IBM being the biggie mm -hmm. in Essex, um, and uh, chunks all over the state. They're, they're, if you look at, you can go on uh, GMP's website, I believe, or the, definitely the Public Service Board's website and see the utility maps. But they're they're in odd configuration. Yeah. And you'll find that um, where the Washington Electric Co-op serves everything that those guys didn't want to because it was hard. <laughs> uh, and the, but there's a lot of other utilities actually, the Burlington Electric Co-op. But there's also there's power company up north in the Northeast Kingdom. There's there's a lot of power companies you don't even think about. They're smaller, and people think there's two because there's two big ones. But there's other power companies in the state. Um, so. The math does look better with three hundred fifty dollars extra three hundred fifty dollars a year. That was the uh, that was the what I was pointing out with the solar GMP, and obviously if there's an adder for CVPS customers, then the same math applies for CVPS customers too. I think that's quite likely to become law. Um, I don't think CVPS is going to fight against it too much. I think that they would be okay with it. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I think you might be surprised about IBM. Or, or, CVPS fighting against it. Maybe. They're not going to do it too publicly, anyway. Um, that's not me. Um, I just want to talk about monitoring systems a little bit, what they, uh, what they can do for you. There are, um, there's a class of monitoring systems. get you before you get off financing. Yeah. Um, in all these these financial models you're doing, are you derating the system at the half percent per year going out? Yeah, you need to. Okay. And do you have is there a decommissioning? I mean, we haven't I've heard anybody talk about what do you do when the panel is no longer have a life? You, usually in those spreadsheets what you want to show is some is actually a resale value rather than a, usually rather than a decommissioning cost. 
uh, because you, you, you generally, at the end of 25 years, you have something that can still should be producing about 80% of the power that it was at the beginning. And so it has some intrinsic value still. Uh, it may not be, make sense, maybe it's taking up valuable space that you could replace the system with 100%, you know, a brand new 100% system in 25 years. Um, but it, 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 should have val it should have value to somebody. So generally, uh, what we've done in some spreadsheets we've done for municipalities is actually show it losing its value, showing it maybe being hard to resell. So you take like a 50% factor or something like that, but then show some, some value. It doesn't actually do too much for most spreadsheets that include the value of money because it's so far out. Sure. But it, um, it, has a, it actually has a value. It, it should. There is also a company called PV. For people who have wanted us to show what the decommissioning cost would be, there's a company in Arizona called PV, PV Recycle that um, will give you a quote on decommissioning the system in 25 years, but essentially it's a small payment. Um, it, it's not, there shouldn't be any costs. You, you have completely recyclable materials if it's a silicon-based system. Um, there are some thin film-based systems that, are, that have cadmium in them, uh, primarily the ones made by a company called First Solar is a leader in, in thin film. And the reason those aren't sold to the residential market, we, we often have wondered this ourselves, and I think the main reason is because they have cadmium in them and they have to be tracked. So you wouldn't want to get a whole bunch of cadmium-based PV systems out there because you'd have to go find them all in 25 <laughs> years and take them out of service. But when they're put into big multi-megawatt arrays, it becomes much easier to track and to figure out what you're going to do, which presumably in 25 years is just you know, bring them all back together and turn them into new modules, so, not without cost. Um, so monitoring, um, the, main, the main thing it does for you is let you know that the PV system is working. The reason the microinverters <coughs> tend to come with monitoring built in is because you tend to have several of them all working in the same system and you'd like to know that they're all working uh, because it would be hard to tell if one wasn't working. So you want, you want some assurance that all your little inverters are working. With one big inverter, you'll know right away because if it's not working, your bill will go up. <laughs> Uh, but if one, one microinverter failed in, in a multi-microinverter system, you want a way of knowing how it's doing. But I think that, that monitoring makes sense for any system uh, for lots of reasons. One, to let other people know what your system's doing, or to let yourself know what your system's doing. Um, it, it, it's become fairly cheap. Uh, I think in a lot of cases it can be you know, an under $1,000 option on a system that is $25,000, and it gives quite a bit of... Uh, peace of mind that the system is doing what you, you know, intended it to do, which is produce power. A and lets you kind of take those PV watts calculations and prove them out. You can see them happening in year one, two, three. You can see what's going on with your system. Um, and you need to look at systems over a long time because weather varies quite a bit. So it gives you a way of, you know, capturing all that data and looking at systems over time to kind of figure out if they're really doing what what somebody said they would do. Does yep. that data go right into your, uh, available to go right into your computer so you can work with it? Work yeah, with that data? well, most of the monitoring uh, companies now provide websites with long-term data storage. Um, we, we, uh, we've been using a lot of systems from a company in Randolph called Wattmetrics, um, and they just use a, you know, a cloud-based uh, storage system that stores you know, lots of data. And um, the, the thing that they really do is provide great graphics that show you what what that what that means. Um, they provide like a just kind of a speed dial based thing for what it's doing instantaneously. They provide really nice graphing for what it's done over the past day, week, month, year, multi year, um, and they provide uh, which is really nice for educational purposes. If the, if if their system is going to be sitting in a public space, they provide what kind of offsets that's doing. What you know what it's offsetting in terms of carbon, in terms of different things like gasoline, coal. So it, it does a lot of calculations instantly and shows you the, the value of the system in lots of ways, mon money, money and otherwise. Can the system also tie in with um, your electrical usage on particular outlets in your home? Can you have that added? Right. So that was a, what, what Wattmetrics and a bunch of other companies that are in that market are doing is making them whole, whole house monitors that also monitor solar. So yeah, they actually tie in right at the breaker panel and they will then tell you, assuming you can match up your breakers with what appliances are really on them, 
they'll tell you what every component in your house is using as well as what energy your production is. And sometimes that may make sense completely independent of doing solar because what most people have found is when they monitor, they reduce. So um, when, you, when you learn that your you know, refrigerator is you know, gobbling up most of your power bill, uh, that's usually an eye opener for most people and, and can even lead them to replace their refrigerator. And so whole house monitoring is, uh, is, re is relatively cheap. Um, I think most whole home monitors are in the seven, six hundred, seven hundred dollar range. And uh, they're pretty easy to install. You, you actually put what are, what are called um, CTs. They're these little uh, coils on each, each circuit that you want to measure. And, uh, and there's usually a unit that's usually wireless uh, Ethernet, and that brings it all back to a central system. And it usually, most of them put it up online. Um, and Google even has a, uh, Google has an energy recording uh, function that, that does the data display for, for some of these generic systems. That, so. so you can little bill known, your kids for using the TV and things like that. Yeah, you can see all, whatever, whatever circuits you want to measure in your home, you can tie, bring them all together and get data for them. So. Um, and then the, I think, I don't think I have, I just want to, yeah, next to last slide. I just wanted to talk about uh, microinverters. Um, what what microinverters um, allow you to do is essentially, they're, they generally are up on the roof with the inverter, or they're up, or they're out in the field with the inverter, and um, they're um, relatively small. They're about that big. They weigh about five pounds, and they're mounted usually right behind the PV. But they're um, NEMA, what's they're called NEMA four rated, meaning they can take direct spray with a water hose. Um, so they're very, they're very weatherproof. Uh, they're they're designed to shed heat pretty well. They're they're basically built as heat sinks. Um, and they're kind of protected by the PV panel itself, so they're, they're fairly well protected up there. Um, each one has all the circuitry needed to convert to AC up on the roof. And so what you, what you get is essentially a package on the roof, which, becomes, which produces DC and then immediately converts to AC and allows you to run that AC back to your breaker panel in the basement or wherever. They're generally about, uh, about this big, by that thick, and about five pounds. About that, about that weight. Um, the, from a design standpoint or what you can do with PV, it opens up a lot of possibility. Let's say the only place you have on your roof is your dormers. You know, that's the really the, north, the south facing is your dormers. You could actually put, uh, you could put one module on a dormer, one dormer and the other module on the other dormer face and that could be your PV system across all your dormers. You could have a, you know, a 10 module system across five, five dormers that way. Um, the things that are very important for a, a central inverter become unimportant for a microinverter. So when people design systems for, for single inverters, they have to be very concerned that all the panels are in the same plane so that they see the same sun, uh, that they aren't shaded in different ways, um, and that they're all facing the same orientation, the same azimuth. Um, a lot of those concerns of designing a single, single inverter system go away. And also, your, your resistance to shading goes way up. So if you have some shading that's going to cover a module in a string inverter setup, you're going to lose power essentially from that whole string while that shading is going on on one module. Whereas if you have dappled sunlight over a microinverter-based <coughs> array, you have no loss in the panels that aren't affected. So that's a big, big technology change. Um, they're going to be slightly more expensive. The in microinverters have been coming down more and more and more in cost, and I think most people's fears about their reliability have been pretty well allayed. They've been in the field for f three years now, and um, they've done pretty extensive testing to show that they've got very long time mean mean time between failure for these for these systems. So I think most people are fairly comfortable that they're. They're producing very good microinverters. That it's because the difficulty obviously is if the microinverter fails, and it's buried under the panels up on the roof. It's a lot harder to fix. <laughs> so, yeah. With the microinverter, does that allow you to get rid of the battery bank in a uh, off-grid system? No. <laughs> no. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's producing AC power, and there's no such thing as an AC battery so there's no there's no way to store it um, and um, you you while well you 
Well, no, and, and unfortunately, due to the UL listing on the inverter, if it doesn't see the grid, it won't produce any power. <laughs> it's a safety feature. <laughs> um, the, the, the UL listing on, on panels, or on inverters, is, is primarily driven by utilities, and they want to they know that that inverter goes away as soon as the grid goes away, so that it doesn't become a hazard for fixing the system. So, no. <laughs> That would be nice. There are some. There are some pretty small. There are some pretty small regular DC and you know DC to AC inverters though that are not too much bigger than a microinverter. So does that mean if if there's a blackout, you're not producing any power? I mean, it, it, the grid goes away to your house. Correct. Then you're you're done. Right. Well, that so that'd be the interest in people having a battery back system because it doesn't go away. It it, it islands essentially uh, safely. So it, it creates an island of electricity in your home safely. It disconnects from the grid, but it keeps your, your circuits powered. So, but yes, in a typical on-grid system, within fractions of a second of the grid going away, your inverter stops working on purpose. Yep. How much more would a system cost to if you were off-grid and you needed a battery and whatever else is required? About how, for the typical house that you gave it for, how much more would it cost? The cost of a battery-based system? Yeah, yeah, for a battery-based system and everything else you might need if you are off-grid. It, it depends on your loads because that's going to affect how, how mm, the battery the gets The example you gave, for example, the example you gave just for that one. Right, but an off-grid design, with, an off-grid design starts differently. Um, an off-grid design starts with what do you want to run? then how long do you want to run it for if there's no sun? Then that determines how big your battery bank's going to be, which then might uh, raise other issues, which is how long, and then how much PV you want in there is going to be affected by do you want to be only based on PV or do you want a generator hybrid system? So there's a bunch of other considerations yeah. in there. But uh, just to give you a, a ballpark, I would say it adds about three to $4,000 to the system. So when would microinverters not be the best choice for every system, and how much of a difference are you paying for a microinverter? Um, probably only, I would, I would say probably less than 15 cents a watt. It's not significantly more right now. And if the rays, I, I still tend to shy away from this. The ray is going to be a big rectangle of panels just because of that. What if the middle one fails? It's just conservative design. Um, so I would say that would be one. Um, but also just, you know, you can just shave that small amount off the cost of the system by, just by doing a string inverter. Um, you know, uh, we have problems with string inverters sometimes, but usually they're pretty reliable for their first 10, 15 years of life. Um, most of them are warrantied for 10 years. Um, some of them are warrantied for 15. Um, the uh, microinverters are all warrantied for 15, I believe. There's a, at least two manufacturers of microinverters now. The, the one primary one is a company called Enphase, uh, which is a U.S.-based company, and there's, a, there's another one that's up and coming. Does the monitoring system, could that tell you if any single panel is not functioning properly? Yeah, absolutely. That's the so if you had the monitoring system, you'd be able to know. Yeah, that's the point of the microinverters coming mm -hmm. with monitoring, essentially, mm -hmm. is so that you, they, they actually provide you with a map on, on their monitoring, which is a map that your array was installed to, and they can, you can point out exactly which module an inverter is not functioning. And are you saying it's much more complicated to repair a, an array that's surrounded by arrays, that you're better off having just two? Well, if you're, let's say you develop like rows let's, of, let, of let, uh, arrays? Let's see, I just uh, I go back to, see if I can go back quickly to a slide here. That one. Hopefully I stop there. Yeah, so that, that, you know, that array there is one, two, three, four, six, seven by three. So a seven by three array of modules. If those middle modules were, it's not so bad in three, but if it's in that middle row buried, you actually have to take apart that whole column to get at that middle because they're, they're, they're put together with clamps in such a way that you have to take apart that whole column. And to that's get expensive to do? Labor-wise. Yeah, is. you're looking at a day you know, a day to do the fix for two guys. Okay. So it's not cheap. 
Thank two you. electricians, essentially. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, 3.5, uh, but this is a, that's a three-year-old system. That would probably be about a 4.2 kilowatt system on the same size right now. Yeah, Brett, uh, this is about a 30-degree angle roof, I think. This one? I, I'm, the one yeah. you're looking at. Yeah, roughly. Yeah, and that's what I have in my system. And uh, the snow hangs around until it gets fairly warm, and then it all comes off in a, in a big rush. Uh, at what point? Let's say a 45 degree uh, roof, a lot less snow problems. Mm, it still sticks. It, this, it this, does. Win, this winter, particularly, it stuck really well. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. But in general, they shed as well as a panels. People ask me that a lot. In general, panels shed about as well as a standing seam roof, just a, as an average. So. Yep. Right, uh, speaking about replacing the microinverter. Uh, brings to mind what happens, uh, or rather, would you speak to your experience with, uh, for instance, asphalt shingles have a lifespan of like 25 years, uh, and let's say you install your solar panels 10 years into that, so 15 years later you're going to have to get at that roof again. Uh, what kind of complications and expense are involved in, in that sort of a situation? Well, generally the, the main wear factor for asphalt shingles is PV, is, um, is uh, UV exposure. So you, on the, generally, you're putting together a system like this. This is on asphalt shingles. Those shingles under that, under the modules, will never wear out. I mean, that, in this case, they were new asphalt shingles, but they should essentially they should, they should be there as long as the modules are there. What you would typically do is if they never put more modules, they're, they're actually planning to put more modules in that bottom space there on this roof. Um, if they did that, you would essentially never touch that roof again. It, it's really going to see almost no sun. And water, water by itself without sun is, is not much of a wear factor at all on asphalt shingles. Um, we also put them on flat roofs, commercial flat roofs. Um, and again, it's basically the same consideration that membrane is mostly worn out by the sun. And it, it will see a lot less sun, so you might end up just weaving a membrane in and flashing near the modules over time. So. Uh, my question is about the 25-year life. Uh, is there enough data around to know how PV panels fail, whether it's a cliff they drop off or whether it's just a gradual degradation? Or So the main data comes from the folks that produce the PV watts calculator, and they have stations. Uh, I believe most of their stations, like the Burlington station, ha that's a there's actual PV, different types of PV at those stations. Uh, and they run also a, a, a lot of, um, in, um, I think primarily in Colorado. Most of their, test, most of their testing is done in Colorado. But um, I think in terms of real-world data, they've got about 12 to 15 years of actual, like, where they were really setting up a lab, you know, an outside lab to look at modules. But then you've got anecdotal, more anecdotal stuff of, of modules that were produced for the space program that, that I was referring to that have been up in a very harsh environment space for a long time functioning properly. And they do, they, they degrade. Um, you know, anywhere from 1% at a worst case down to like, you know, less than half a percent per year. But they definitely degrade. But it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty well well defined. So it's, in terms of residential use, it's almost too early to talk what experience is for 25 years. Because well, no, I think, I think that the NREL, NREL's data is, is, is set up as if it was, you know, out, is, a, is a real outdoor environment for them. And, you know, you've got over a decade. But, but, you know, I, the, the other thing that, that module manufacturers do to try and improve their claims is they do, extend, they do um, enhanced wear testing on them, so they expose them to double and triple suns worth of sun and also, you know, an increased amount of, of water, and they try and prove their claims that way, too. So they, I think they're fairly successful. Uh, you mentioned earlier, I think it was cadmium in the thin film panels. Could you speak a little to other considerations if somebody wanted to install a PV system and do it with the least environmental impact? What kind of uh, system design considerations or product manufacturers, things like that, they should be considering? Yeah. All right. Uh, the, the, probably the number one consideration is actually would be what it's made out of. Most, uh, most modules are made out of silicon, which is essentially sand, but in a highly processed form. Um, it has to be put through a furnace with a tremendous amount of energy to turn it into usually what's called polysilicon for most of the modules available on the market 
or uh, in some cases uh, mono, mono, uh, monocrystalline. But uh, both of those are relatively the same in terms of energy input. Um, there's, I don't know what the energy input is on thin film manufacture, but I think it's roughly the same. It's a different type of process that, that produces the, the photovoltaic material. But the, um, just in terms of what goes into it, there, you, know, you, have, you, you have two different materials. The ones that are made out of um, cadmium telluride is um, it, it's a hazardous substance. I mean, it's encapsulated the exact same way as the silicon. It's in glass and tedlar and aluminum, but it, it is itself hazardous. You wouldn't want it to ever end up in the landfill, um, that kind of thing. So, so there's that basic consideration of what's it made out of. The other probably consideration is where is it made. Um, you know, uh, there was an article two years ago in the New York Times that said, if, you know, if you're happy buying your, happy buying your oil from the Saudis, you'll be happy buying your panel, your solar panels from the Chinese. Uh, it's kind of true. Um, they're definitely dominating the manufacture of, of modules now, um, but it means they had to be made in China and shipped here, which is a fairly big energy cost. Uh, for our first two years of existence, we used all evergreen solar made in Massachusetts. Um, but they just moved that entire plant to China. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it, uh, the, the production of modules is, uh, is definitely the, the major trend is to produce them as cheaply as possible, like pretty much everything else we, we buy as consumers, uh, and, and PV modules aren't, aren't immune to that. Um, so, uh, of, of US made, um, I can just list off some US made ones. There's shot made in. The, the really interesting thing is that because of the Recovery Act and its requirement to buy American, many on, offshore companies have built plants here to build modules specifically for the Recovery Act. So Schott, which is a German company, makes them in Oregon. Uh, Silicon, which is a Spanish company, makes them in San Diego. Um, Motec, which is a Taiwanese company, makes them in Delaware, which used to be a GE plant. Um, there's a few others, but there's... Uh, a company called Suniva makes the module components, the, the silicon itself in Atlanta, ships them to India to be put together, and ships them back. <laughs> they, then, they then qualify as American because of the content is American, but the assembly is. So uh, laws play a big, have a big effect on where stuff gets made. If you have a standing seam roof, what are, what are the options? I know there are some laminates. Are these the cadmium materials, or what is the cost, or is there a benefit for installing this on a standing seam roof? Yeah, the, the, um, the, you, it's hard to see there, but that, that back roof with the, the dark area and that back roof is a, is a laminate product. We, did, we actually did, Renew, Renew Energy Systems did the pull mount, and another company did the laminate years before. Um, that laminate's from a company in Michigan called Unisolar, and They've never really, while they do warranty it for a new standing seam roof, they've never warranted it for existing standing seam roofs. So that's a problem with their product. But also their main problem with their product has been cost. It's just never been very cost effective compared to modular solar, to solar that's put into a module. Um, on the other hand, it, it, if the roof color matches it, it can absolutely disappear on the roof. It's, it's very nice. Um, the standard way that we will put modules on a roof um, if you're ever in Norwich, you can see it done very elegantly. We did it on Danowitz General Store. Um, but generally, you clip to the seam with a product that uh, is a patented block. It clips to the seam, and it gives you a mount point for rails. And then you put the modules to those rails. Um, though in the case of Danowitz, we went right to, the, right to the block. So it's actually quite low on the roof. Uh, do you know if the bill that's coming up in the legislature that requires the utilities to pay a certain amount would be retroactive, meaning that it would pay for people who already have systems installed? My, I don't know. It would probably depend on the bill's language, but uh, I would think that w what the requirement would be would probably be that you put in the separate meter because solar, like, uh, GMP's, pro um, GMP's solar GMP program runs with a separate meter. You actually have a production meter separate from your, your net meter meter. The one that you have your net meter, you have your regular meter, which becomes your net metering meter, which can run both directions. But you have a separate meter that only, only counts up, and that's your solar GMP credit. So I'd imagine if that piece of legislation passes, depending on how they word it, you would probably 
you probably either have to pay for that meter's installation or you may, might be able to get reimbursed. So, so uh, GMP actually reimburses you for the cost of that meter installation as part of the solar installation, up to $300, I think. But once you did that, I, I would think you could probably get an existing system included in it. I don't, I don't know. There, I'm sure all our customers, everyone, everyone will want to do that if it's possible. I'm sure CDPS would try to maybe prevent that. From deal. Well, you know, actually, I think the real thing that isn't addressed is um, who gets the renewable energy credits? Because once they're metered like that, they become valuable, uh, especially if you aggregate them over, over all the people that CBPS have that have solar. If they aggregate that all and they own the renewable energy credits from it, they would have a lot less resistance to this bill. It will be directly, because it can meet their renewable portfolio standard, and it can help them in lots of other ways. Um, so I think it's, what, and so GMP has never clarified really who owns, I mean, for right now, customers own those renewable energy credits. But if, if you know, if this, if, the, if it turns out that the renewable energy credits are owned by uh, the utility, they'd be very happy to go install a meter for you. I'm thinking about assessing a site, and um, let's say that we've got, oh, look at that picture. There's a, a tree that has no leaves on it, and you would think, well, if that were providing just a little shade on the, uh, on the array, I would, most of the sun would come through, but I, it, it's not true. It, uh, there's a st string that, oh, could you explain that? Well, well, usually, what um, if we do a, a shading study? When we do it, you, if you're getting thinking about getting solar installed, you should have a site visit done, and the uh, solar uh, sh site visit should include um, at least a minimal, unless it's very obvious. Well, a lot of a lot of sites are obvious, but if it's not obvious, it should include a, so a shading study. And what a shading study usually consists of, it either can be done with an electronic, completely electronic instrument that can just take a fisheye view of the whole surrounding and, and do a and do a, a algorithmic calculation of what the shading is, um, or you can take a digital picture of a um, of a device, or or even at the lowest level you can just make a tracing uh, onto a onto a, a sheet of graph paper essentially. Um, but what you come out with is tracings around all the vegetation, the profile of all the vegetation, and generally you would go around a deciduous tree like that, and um, in some software, you can mark it as deciduous so that it, it'll it knock it out in the worst time of the year to knock it out, which is summer, but it'll do that whole calculation. But if you had something you were explaining to me earlier, like a pole, yeah. um, whose shadow was cast over the array, yep. that not only blocks the small pieces of the array, <clears throat> excuse me, that are impacted, but the whole string. Could you explain that? Right. So when, when in without if, if in a microinverter, let's say we're talking about one of these these ten these ten module poles here. Let's say let's say there were strings of two strings of ten in this that made up this system. If you had a substantial portion of one module being being shaded, you'd essentially lose all ten in a string inverter type of situation. So uh, you're 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 fairly sensitive to that shading and. Uh, most of the most of the software that does uh, shading calculations for you, if it if it then tells you your expected energy output, we'll we'll take that into account. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Okay. Um, so, what about your electrical system itself? Um, do you need to be addressing that before you're looking at solar PV? That's one question. Can I answer that one? Sorry. Yes. Okay. So yeah, sometimes um, if your electrical system is just very minimally sized for the house as it exists now, there might be a need to um, basically spend a little bit more on the installation of the solar because you're going to actually tie into your electrical service directly. Uh, it's called a line tap. You're actually going to go around the back of your back of your breaker panel and tie directly into your uh, system, or possibly even you might need to upgrade your your service. But that's usually rare. Um, but it's also possible that you might have to create a larger breaker box if you're completely full, filled. You have no spaces in your breaker box. So there, yes, there can be there can be need. They're usually fairly minimal in terms of cost, but there there can be need to upgrade your electrical system. Okay, thank you. And kind of related to that, so what should your 
provider considerations be? We talked about site, you know, um, so is there a checklist of good questions you should be asking yourself in terms of selecting a provider? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of selecting a provider, you want to want somebody with um, a track record of doing system installations is always good, though. Obviously, when we were first starting up, we were just hoping to get some get some trusting people. Um, so a good track record of installs, um, a, an ability to do the site visit and to explain clearly to you what what the what the numbers will mean and to do a shading study if needed um, are probably good indicators that they're, they're, if their sales force can can talk you through what all the numbers are and, and what they are for your very specific site after having done a shading study is a good check checklist item. <coughs> um, let's see. Um, I think, you know, basically, I think probably experience and the ability to explain what the system will do are, are probably your key factors in deciding, and then maybe cost would be the third. So you, you might want to get estimates from multiple companies and compare. Uh, hi, I'm Jennifer Molyneux from the Addison County Economic Development Office. <laughs> and I wrote to you to warn you I would be here. <laughs> I'd love to hear about um, solar chargers for electric cars. Yep. So um, we've done two systems uh, so far that are, are specifically car charger stations um, for CVPS, um, also in Rutland. That one of them's near the larger array that was built, uh, and one of them's, uh, you, you won't see it, it's at a CVPS facility on Grove Street in Rutland. But they're the same car chargers. Um, but the, public, the very public one is right in front of the big array on Route 7. Um, uh, those those systems are um, are based on a uh, I think it's a, a seven and a half kilowatt uh, Coulomb charger. It's called a seven seven and a half kilowatt charger. So they're um, neither of them is being f even though CVPS might explain it that way. Neither of them is being fully powered by the sun at any given time. Though you could think of it as they're powered by the sun over the course of the whole day if X amount of cars actually come up and charge. But they're, they're, the Coulomb charger actually is taking more instantaneously than the, either of those arrays can produce. I mean, I think they're two and three kilowatt arrays. They're, they're, but over the course of two hours, uh, that array, it, two, two full sun hours, or, or in Vermont we have an average of four full sun hours. So over the course of a, uh, of course of a day, they, those, those arrays could charge up probably two cars, you know, and, and still call it solar powered charging. Um, in terms of that, in terms of using that charger, um, I, I've seen different things. Um, the um, the Ford Focus that's coming out that's going to be electric only um, is um, it, they at 240 volts. Uh, they say they can charge. Um, I think pretty much completely in. I want to get this right. I think overnight, basically. At uh, 400, at a commercial voltage of charging, they can charge um, in a half hour. So, yeah, well, they not not fully charged, but they can give you like an hour driving range in a half hour, something like that. Um, and I, I haven't, I, I didn't have a chance to actually do the math um, of what size array you would need to offset it. But my guess is, I, I, did, this, I did this earlier for something like a, a Tesla, which are quite, quite a bit more effect, uh, efficient, but on the other hand, they're like a quarter million dollars or something. Um, you, with our sun, I, I think you're looking at something on the order of uh, three, to, three to five. You're looking at essentially almost a house-sized system to charge the, charge the car, which you know, might be something that you would be interested in, but, but it would be a dedicated, you know, it would be a system. If you wanted to you know, say, this is my electric car and this is my array to charge it, I think you're looking in, the, you know, at least two, two kilowatt size array, probably, probably a little bit bigger to, to really be able to say, this array charges this car all the time in Vermont with our sun. But I think it's worth looking at what, what their actual power draw is from like the, like the Coulomb charger that CVPS, and that CVPS will have some data pretty soon. If you can, um, Dan, a guy named Dan Perry is kind of in charge of both those systems at, at CVPS, and he'll have some real world data. Because if no one, even if no one else pulls up to those chargers, uh, CVPS has a couple electric cars that they're plugging into them all the time. So they should have some data on 
how long it really takes them, to, how much power they really use when they charge. Right. And then the, the, the calculation on the array is just PV watts. So, so in, in this question, I, I believe, if I understand correctly, you've been addressing uh, charging a car that, through a grid-tied system. How feasible is it to do it off-grid? Well, no, I, it, actually, I think it's irrespective of whether it's on or off-grid, but you would have to think about having a separate system. One, one of the interesting things about when people talk about electric cars is the ability to, to make them the batteries for the grid. Because you, you have, a, the, like, the Ford Focus and the, the, um, the Nissan uh, Leaf, and they all have fairly substantial batteries. I mean, they have... Um, they have essentially, like in a given off-grid system, most of these cars have batteries that are almost twice as big as your, as your average off-grid house. So, I mean, they're, they're packing quite a bit of battery, and they're, they're doing it by, they, they don't have all that weight because they're doing it with lithium-ion batteries. Um, but those batteries are, are substantial battery, battery arrays, and the, the goal might be to somehow have them provide power when they're not in use um, and charge them up separately. But... You could definitely imagine a system for off-grid. I don't know of anyone that's actually packaged up such a system that, that count on the car being there for battery storage and for running the house. Not, not actually. It's still, still science fiction. I'm, I'm sure you know about this, but just for the general information, uh, there's a, uh, a magazine called Home Power yeah. that's kind of the, the Bible of the industry. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, the Hillsley gets a subscription, and there you go and keeps the back issues, so I really would urge people to check that out. Yeah, I, I, I'm always, uh, Home Power actually is one of the preeminent um, writers on, uh, on the National Electric Code, he writes an article for Home Power. It's pretty interesting that he, I mean, he's like the go-to person he has been for 25 years for the part of the electrical code that talks about renewable energy. Yeah, he writes an article for Home Power. Um, I hope you didn't cover this already and I just missed it, but uh, uh, do the panels work in overcast skies at all? I mean, they, they're still light, but there must be some reduction in efficiency. Yeah, um, most panels are, most um, silicon-based panels are looking for pretty much direct sunlight. In other words, light that could cast a shadow um, to work effectively. Uh, they will produce some, probably in the 10% to 15% production when it's overcast, it's significantly less. Um, some of the um, thin film technologies produce more. It's still significantly less than they produce optimally, but it might be in the 20 to 25 percent of their of their production when when it's overcast. Um, but their their downside is they tend to be less efficient overall, so you're covering more area with thin film. Could you go back to laminates? Because I, I, I think I'm confusing it with thin film, because I think laminate, thin film, what are the differences? Between no, they are generally this. Well, yeah, the laminates shown in this, in this picture are also thin film. But many thin film modules that are, are produced commercially are, are put into module form. So they look exactly like a silicon-based PV module. They, they're not laminates. It's, just, it's a different production method. Okay. So whereas initially they might start as a roll, you know, they actually, they call it a roll-to-roll, roll-to-roll -roll production process. So mm -hmm. you, you start with a roll of foil on one end, and you end up with a roll of PV material on the other. What they typically do is take that roll, cut it up, and put it into modules. So. Okay, so it's not like you can get a laminate made out of silicon, then. They don't do there that. There are, no, the, and the, actually, well, yeah, just to confuse it oh. even more, those, those, those laminates are actually silicon. And they're, they're what's called, I didn't even mention it, but they're mm -hmm. amorphous silicon which has a very low efficiency okay. and had a promise of great cost savings, but has never, never borne that out okay. in the market. I have a question about off the grid. Uh, I assume with off the grid that you would use the converter downstream of the battery. Is that correct? So uh, you would feed DC directly into the batteries from the uh, panels? Uh, directly, except there's a charge, a charging charge controller, so I can't overcharge the batteries. Right. Yep. Yeah, so the diagram. And, and actually, actually, in a modern charge controller, so it can do what's called maximum power point tracking, mm -hmm. which is what all the inverters for on-grid do as well, which means they, um, they noodle around with the voltage and amperage to get the most power out of the modules, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, just uh, back to the inverters. I know what you said about panels. Like, they're all 
code and so it sounds like just do the best shopping mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. but when it comes to inverters are there certain manufacturers that you should really be paying attention to and others that you should avoid or is there a site that can give you that information well, i know home the, power does a good job yeah so. and and the california energy commission gives you a ranking of, of real world efficiency the ce there's a it's called a cec rating for inverters so that's a good you know that's a good benchmark um, there are fewer inverter makers, though, overall. There's probably only 20 or 30 inverter makers worldwide. So there's, there's, there's fewer companies to pick from, um, and they're all tend to have been around for a while. So they all have pretty good track records. I think you could say across the board, they all have fairly long track records of making inverters. Select, Selectria is made in Massachusetts. Um, they were around making electric cars long before the current crop of electric cars, and they converted into becoming an inverter company, and they've been quite successful. A uh, question about the energy balance. Uh, it seems to me I've heard that the amount of energy that goes into making solar panels gets kind of paid back in a year or so. Does that ring true? Or a years? That's very optimistic. I think the best I've seen is more, more like two years. Two years. Yeah, and then so the, the low, low end would be maybe more like four years. Yeah. Um, some. Some panels are made with a lot of labor, and they're made very inefficiently, which if they're made with a lot of labor, they're also made with a lot of energy, tends to be. So typically, the monocrystalline modules that are just essentially take an ingot of, you know, of, of silicon, cut it with some kind of sawing technology, and you leave a lot of that on the floor, unfortunately, in that process, and then put that wafer into a module and, and solder contacts to it. So it can be very it can be very labor intensive at that end, and that usually means it's pretty energy intensive too. Is there any kind of um, tabulation or you know result? To, to uh, if anyone's done it, it'll probably be the National Renewable a NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab has, has probably looked at energy energy inputs. Yeah. Any other questions? Here's one. one. One last question. If I understand the, um, the thoughts behind what a lot of people are asking, many of us want to have a backup system off the grid, but we may not, might not be prepared to go entirely off the grid and forego net metering. So is there some kind of a hybrid or a compromise whereby you could have something that would well, be net metering some of the time, but if the power went down, you could pull a switch and mm -hmm. still have your computer, your refrigerator, and your water pump function. Right. So the I, I don't think I spent too much time on it, but so the battery backed a battery backed on grid system does exactly what you're talking about. And like uh, Elizabeth was asking about the the, the incremental cost of that, I, I think somewhere three to, three to four thousand dollars for the batteries and the extra complication of installing the system, but. Um, that's that does that. So it, it essentially turns your home into an island of power, separate from the grid when the grid goes away. Um, it's quite nice. nice. I mean, it's, I've nice. seen. I've been in many homes that have it, and it, it works usually pretty flawlessly. You don't, usually don't know the power's out. So. In in order to get started on a project like that, can you can you start backwards with the battery backup first, and then add the panels later? Uh, yes, you could, because the batteries form the basis of the, the kind of steady voltage for the system. Yeah, yeah. so you could definitely, um, you can definitely start with a, a battery-based system. You could start with an entirely battery-based system, which yeah. is just an un uninterruptible power supply, and add modules. Yeah. One thing, you, you might want to add at least one module because you'll qualify for the federal tax credit. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions? No? Okay, well, Brett is willing to stay. Um, if you have questions about your own home that are very specific and you need more time with him, he's willing to stay. So thank you very much for coming to our program, and we hope to see you next month on April 20th for Geothermal. Let's give Brett a hand of applause.